Hey, what's up you guys? It's Ruthie and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, we're going to go into chapter 29 of the game by Lindsay Miller. So I hope that you guys are ready for this video. This video may contain sensitive topics and foul language. If you do not wish to continue, I suggest you click off the video now. You have been warned. Chapter 29. Leah didn't go to sleep immediately. She sent an email to the council. How did you know it wasn't me and why didn't you say anything? The response didn't come until Sunday morning. We do not interfere in the lives of civilians, no matter how disastrously they may be. Lincoln leaves us alone to do as we may, so we leave Lincoln alone to do as it may. <coughs> Which didn't really help. Leah's mother dropped her off at school Monday, one minute before the first bell rang. Devin and Jim were waiting on the sidewalk near the drop-off, and Leah's mom said nothing when Leah said goodbye. Surely she wasn't really a suspect now, and Detective James was letting her go to school, but they meant they had no clue what it who it was at who it actually was if today didn't work things would get worse leo wouldn't let anything happen to devin or anyone else no matter what how are you doing she asked devin devin leaned in and kissed her cheek i've been better i made a list leo pulled out her journal and held it to jim i narrowed it down to seven people in our biology class who aren't playing the game the council didn't give me anything new the seven the council might have meant were sam douglas crystal fowler hannah henry faith franklin suzanne smith Penny Preston and Jessica Thompson. You can add Mateo, even though I hate to say it, Jim said. He withdrew before the email was sent. Leah added him, but it was hard to picture Mateo killing anyone. It was hard to picture anyone she knew as a killer. Leah looked around at the kids milling about. Maybe they were wrong. Maybe it wasn't even a senior or a student. It was too late for that now. At least they were safe at school. They had barely slept the night before. There were too many thoughts in her mind. Time to sit in biology and hope the killer isn't in there. I hope they are, Devin muttered. I want this over. They made their way to Miss Christie's class, only she was in there. Only she was in there that early. The first bell still a few minutes away. Devin, Jim, and Leah looked. Leah took their seats in the very back, and Miss Christie handed them a packet outlining what would be happening over the next few weeks. After today, school was canceled for a week to give everyone time to grieve and the police time to find the killer. If the cancellation lasted longer, the school had prepared another packet to send out to students by email. How bleak for everyone to be prepared for weeks of murder, of a murderer carrying on. Leah didn't read the whole sheet. <coughs> they would end this today we have to leave our bags and phones in homeroom during lunch Devin said that's annoying jim turned the first page over is orchestra still meeting tonight we are Devin said but only for a few minutes to vote on what we want to do about this spring concert and rehearsals maybe we should steal the key to homeroom so we can come back during lunch and go through bags leo whispered she mapped out where everyone was sitting in the back of her journal and circled the eight that needed to investigate serial killers keep trophies maybe they'll have one and if not maybe they'll, they left my account open on their phone it would be hard to unlock their phones but not impossible probably whoever the killer was had guessed leah's password how hard could it be okay second idea we asked miss christie if we can do some work in here during lunch jim said she'll still have to leave to heat up her food and supervise the start of lunch like she always does and she's not going to say no to us she won't leah asked jim sighed excuse me you're so used to your parents saying no that you dismiss the idea of asking adults for help entirely. Excuse me. Devin leaned over Leah's shoulder, one hand on her arm. I'll do it. She won't say no to me. Do it at the end of class, Leah said. Her hunt for schedules last semester had taught her that people were most likely to agree to something simple if they wanted to leave quickly. The other students began to trickle into class after the first bell rang. Hannah and Penny were first, taking their seats in the middle row in somber silence and Mateo in a hoodie and sweatpants instead of his normal ugly sweater. Nodded to Devin and he slipped into his seat a few desks over from Devin. Faith stopped at Miss Christie's desk as she entered and took two of the handouts. She wore gray leggings and a red University of Arkansas fitted t-shirt. Her black tennis shoes looked new. George is sick, Hannah said. Her mom said it looks like food poisoning. Leah glanced at Jim and mouthed, poisoning? Maybe the killer was stepping out of their comfort zone of blitz attacks and, tri and trip wires. They shrugged. The rest of the students on Leah's list wandered in right before the tardy bell. Susanna out of breath and Sam crackling Cracking a smile as he skidded into class just as it rang, he caught sight of Abby and George's empty seats and winced. Faith patted his arm as he passed. She's just at home, she said. No reason not to focus on the school. Hannah nodded. She'll be fine. Faith hummed and Sam dropped his backpack next to his desk, collapsing into his seat. God, they were all falling apart one by one. The killer had screwed up everything. Class went by far more slowly than it ever had. They didn't 
study biology so much as write down what they might need for the final once school was back in session and most of class was devoted to talking about the cancellation. Faith was terrified the cancellation would affect college admissions and Hannah was afraid no one would get to walk at graduation. No one seemed to have heard about Leah's failed chase at least. At the end of class, once everyone else had left and Ms. Christie was about to stand, Devin cleared his throat. Ms. Christie, Devin asked, approaching her desk, is there any way we could stay here during lunch? He gestured to Leah and Jim at the back of the room. I know it's a lot to ask, but lunch is when people keep asking questions. Devin's voice wavered a touch and Leah's fingers tensed. She had tried so hard not to think about the empty spaces around them or the questions Devin and Jim might have faced when she wasn't in school. It's just a lot, you know, Jim said from next to Leah. And your class is near our third block class. Miss Creasy took a deep breath. If I let you stay in here, you have to clean up after yourselves. Of course, Devin said. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. By the time lunch had arrived, the school halls was buzzing with news of Georgia's absence and bets on the school would shut down for the rest of the semester. Devin wrapped one arm around Leah's ways to stop her from tackling Sam, whose bet had involved one more death. If it's not him, she whispered to Devin, I'm still punching him. He squeezed her and let and let go. Let me buy you some brass knuckles first. Now, Miss Christie said once they reached her room and the other students had dropped off their bags and their chairs and left, you three sit in your normal seats and relax and I will be back in five minutes. She vanished out the door with her lunch tote. See, Jim said, heading for for the bags, ask and you shall receive. They went down the rows, methodically going through the students' bags, searching for something, anything that would connect the, to the crimes. Two minutes in, and none of them had found anything useful. Leah opened a bag without looking at whose it was and pulled out several neatly organized journals. You know how... You know high school is too much when you need three agendas for one year. Jim snorted. Leah flipped through the first one and her head swam at the multicolored bullet points and to-do list. She slid it back into the place. The bag was impeccably packed with little pouches to keep everything private and neat. She pulled out the next journal. This one was a buttersoft letter notebook tied shut with leather strips and Leah was struck by the winding way the bow was tied. The first page of the journal was only a contact page. The upper right corner slightly bent. Leah turned it over. Abby's name decorated the top of the first page. Next to it was a pale blue box filled in, the edges meticulously lined so that none of the ink bled through. Leah ran a hand down the page. Morning runs through pleasant pines with omelet. Breaks on bridge for five minutes. First target for assassins. Assassination is Mark Crook's a root. The page was full of notes. Leah turned to the next page, fingers shaking. Hey, Devin, the little triangle means change, right? Leah asked, even though she knew the answer. He checked his watch and put a phone back into the bag. He was searching. Yeah, why? Leah nodded. Ben's name was at the top of the second page, and beneath it, in the jagged caps of Leah's own handwriting, was allergic to latex, EpiPen, and pocket. The EpiPen note had been whited out, and beneath it was a color-coded copy of Ben's daily schedule from Leah's assassin's journal next to it, a smaller copy of May's schedule from her soccer practices to her weekend sleepovers with her best friend had been taped neatly to the journal at the cut edges covered with Do It Today, an alarm clock struck stickers. A purple box had been filled next to his name. A few notes lined the margins and loop, looping cursive. Leah turned the journal sideways to read. Stays with team after practice to carpool, and RXN appears 5 to 10 meters after exposure. Oh, 5 to 10 minutes after exposure. <coughs> Excuse me. Fear settled heavily, heavy and cold in the base of Leah's spine, and she sat down on the floor next to the bag. Devin paused. Leah, he asked. Two minutes left, Jim said. What are you doing? She turned to the next page. Cassie's schedule had been carefully printed and pasted into the book as well, and the notes jotted down in cheerful yellow ink. An email address and password were highlighted at the top of the page. Next to them was a sticker in the shape of a lock. Another square yellow was next to her name. So organized, Leah whispered, flipping to the next page. So meticulous. This. Devin's name was handwritten at the top of the page in calligraphy and a schedule written out by hand. Leah had never followed him, and so none of this inf his information was in her journal. Oxford-style notes took up the page. The left-hand side was an outline of things to cover in the emails to Devin. The bottom of the page included footnotes and minuscule cursive referring to his schedule and tendencies outlined on the page proper. Garlic bread was underlined in spring green. The box next to his name was empty. Check the bag. The phone in this bag, Leah said now. Jim rifled through the smaller pocket, unzipped a little leather pouch, and pulled out the phone. We need the passcode. One minute. Devin tossed everything back into the bag and zipped it. Skip it. 
No, Leah said. Give it to me. She held it up and tilted it back until the oily surface revealed the four prints with little scratches from Faith's nail stared back at Leah. One, five, and zero, Leah said. Devin Winston rifled through the rest of the bag. I think that's 81 possible passcodes. 36, Jim said. That's 36 possibilities if we, if each one is used at least once is repeated. Work smarter, not harder, Leah whispered. Even now, days later, Leah could remember the tone Faith had used when asking Leah about her test scores. Leah typed in 1510 and the phone unlocked, revealing a home page cornered off into a neat little squares of full apps. Leah opened the last used mail app and found nothing. There was no emails to Devin. She looked up the phone's IP address and locked the phone, putting it back into its pouch. Time, Devin said. Closing the bag was searched. He was searching. Leah put it away. She couldn't move. The scuff of Miss Christie's crocs echoed down the hall. Jim ripped the journal from Leah's trembling hands and returned it to the backpack. Devin darted to the aisles to make sure everything was in place, and the two of them took their seats. Leah lingered, standing near her desk. She knew whose bag it was, but she checked her desk map to confirm whose seat it was anyway. Her finger traced the edges of the killer's name. I did everything right, Leah whispered. I'm not sure why I didn't get higher. I earned it. Devin stared at her, eyes wide, and the pencil in his grip snapped. Jim looked from him to Leah. What, they asked? Leah, Miss Christie, called from the door. Is everything all right? You look frightened. Leah turned to her. She felt light. She felt cold. She was completely unmoored from her body, and the words tumbled out of her in an awkward staccato. I'm fine. Thank you. I just realized something I should have noticed earlier. Her teacher nodded and sat at her desk. Leah crumpled up the page of her journal and tossed it into the trash. She sat between Devin and Jim. You know who it is, don't you? Jim asked quietly. Devin nodded, and Leah opened up her assassin's journal. It was a taunt. Her knowledge had done this. Her drive to win had gotten her friends killed. She copied my journal and color-coded the, all the information she stole, whispered Leah. Our lives are just footnotes to her. That is the end of this chapter. I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.